I'll introduce myself first. So I'm, I'm Tristan Stevenson. I uh, am a bar operator and owner. Um, I have opened four bars and restaurants in the last five years, um, three of them in London, two of which I no longer have anymore, I've sold them on, uh, and two which I do. One uh, is the Worship Street Whistling Shop, uh, which is in East London on, on Worship Street, funnily enough. Uh, and uh, that bar actually was modelled uh, on a Victorian gin palace. Um, we didn't have the money to go out and uh, get a lease on one of these uh, beautiful original gym palaces that we're lucky enough to have in London. But uh, we, we found a site that we could make work and we, we decorated it up and wanted to try and relive some of that uh, grandness of the gym palaces uh, that are now sadly all being operated as average pubs. And uh, uh, that we did that and uh, gins has been a big focus on our cocktail list um, ever since then, that was three years ago. We had um, incidentally, whistling shop, another slang term for an old gin drinking house, comes from, it's a corruption of wassail, which is of course is the old English word for cheers. Um, and then we've just opened another place down in Cornwall, which is where I'm based from now, uh, and where I came from originally. Uh, that's called Surfside. Not so much a gin focus there, I might add. Um, the focus is more on lobster and steak, uh, which is pretty cool as well. Um, I will be conducting seminars on those two subjects in the not too distant future because I'm currently cooking uh, and in fact I'm getting the night train down tonight so I can get in the kitchen tomorrow morning. Um, aside from the bars, uh, I'm also a consultant. Uh, my company Fluid Movement was set up five years ago uh, for beverage consultancy globally. Um, we've consulted on somewhere in the region of 70 different projects around the world. Um, across over 30 countries um, and I also travel a lot doing seminars a little bit like this of course I didn't have to travel that far today well actually I did because I just came from Paris but yeah. um, and uh, aside from all of that I'm also a writer um, and my first book The Curious Bartender came out in uh, October of last year and um, was a bestseller in the Evening Standard which took me by surprise because cocktail books don't normally sell quite that well um, but nonetheless it was it was uh, it was a nice surprise and um, I'm now working on book book two I've just finished book three I'm starting on and book four is in the pipeline as well so lots and lots of writing which is partly why I've attempted to retire in Cornwall but ended up actually cooking steak and killing lobsters and, and cooking them obviously uh, it would just be mean if I was killing them and not eating them so uh, that's me um, I've used up seven minutes already. Uh, that's good. I was hoping it would be more like 15 though, but anyway. Uh, so, uh, what I'm going to talk to you about today, I'm just going to open this up so I can actually see what I'm, I'm saying, um, uh, is uh, the martini and, uh, and gin within the martini, of course, which is, uh, some would say, essential. Others would say that you can put vodka in there instead, but given present company, I think we'll stick with gin. Uh, and. Uh, it's a, it's a drink that's very close to my heart and anyone who works behind a cocktail bar um, will, will possess a certain amount of reverence towards the martini. I mean, it is the definitive cocktail. Um, famous cocktail writer that many uh, bartenders sort of look to uh, for, for good quotes and references and, and he wrote pretty much the, the best cocktail book that's ever been written called The Fine Art of Mixing Drinks. Uh, it was David A. Embury. He wrote that in 1948, I think. And he described the martini in that book as the ultimate of all aperitif drinks. So, you know, taking that quote on face value, it means that we should be drinking martinis before we eat every meal. Um, and during, why not? Uh, <laughs> and you don't want to lose your hunger in the middle of a meal, do you? Um, and uh, it, is, it is a special one, which makes it all the more weird uh, as to why it's only two ingredients. Uh, and why those two ingredients go so well together. And uh, it's, it's a question that many of us have asked. I mean, you know, when you take something like rum and mix it with lime and sugar, there's, a, there's an obvious uh, affinity there between those ingredients. Uh, I mean, limes grow in hot countries. Rum is made from sugarcane, which grows in hot countries. Sugar is also from sugarcane. So the three match quite nicely, and lo and behold, you have a daiquiri. It makes perfect sense. But to take something like vermouth, um, which is a wine base, it's been sweetened, it's been flavoured with uh, different, oh thank you, um, is that a clue that you just want me to start making drinks? Shut up and uh, crack on. 
Uh, you know, it's a wine, it's been sweetened, it's flavoured with um, herbs, spices, I suppose much in the same way as gin, but it's a different set, that's for sure. Uh, and uh, and then sometimes put in wood and flavour with wormwood as well, that sort of uh, bittering herb, um, which is where vermouth gets its name from originally, by the way. Uh, the German word for wormwood is vermouth. It's a corruption of that. Um, and yet, then we combine it with uh, a product like gin, which is, as we know, uh, made from uh, neutral spirit that has been redistilled with a selection of uh, spices, botanicals, uh, fruits, herbs, whatever it may be. Um, with the dominant flavour of juniper. Which, by the way, on that point, I, I always find it amazing how, how, this is a slight aside, how much of a phenomenon gin is, given that it is simply a flavoured spirit with a certain selection of flavours, be it spices, fruit, um, juniper, obviously, and, uh, and citrus. And yet those selections of fruit could have been anything. They could have been caraway seed, they could have been... Um, nuts or, or anything, but ju juniper seems to have been the one that stuck and there we have a category that is completely unique um, in, in the set of the five main categories we have, whiskey, vodka, um, rum, uh, gin, tequila, uh, in that it's, it's a product of the flavourings that have been put into it rather than a product of the product it's made from originally, such as sugar cane or agave or, or grain. Um, and it's fascinating, I think, that it's, it's, it's you know, uh, so close to our hearts now, and yet it could have been any other flavours, really. It's just juniper that seems to have stuck. Anyway, I digress slightly, um, but think on that. It is interesting. Um, so we combine these two together, and it could be any of these, by the way. I'm not the brand loyalty here today. Um, combine these two together, and uh, you have this special drink, a martini. And uh, it could have been gin and something else, it could have been vermouth and something else, but this is the one that stuck, and it has stuck now for around <coughs> about, uh, pushing, a, pushing 100 years, um, in fact, just over 100 years. And I'll, I'll, before I make any drinks, I'll just tell you a little bit about the history of it. Um, the, the martini, no one truly knows exactly when it was invented or how it's invented, but what we do know is that it's very, very likely um, based on the earlier cocktail called the Martinez. And the Martinez, in turn, is also based on the Manhattan. Um, so you get this kind of lineage of, of mixed drinks that takes us down to the Martini, which, which is the one that appears to have stuck and, and kind of uh, the, the, the ball stopped rolling after that. Um, but the Manhattan is uh, comprised of bourbon or rye whiskey, um, two parts of that, so one part of usually sweet vermouth, but sometimes dry vermouth, uh, and then bitters stirred down, strained out into a glass that looks a lot like this. Uh, the Martinez is pretty much the same, um, but the addition of a couple of liqueurs, typically uh, a dash of orange liqueur and a dash of cherry liqueur, um, and, and gin instead of uh, bourbon or rye, stirred down. So there's an obvious kind of transition there as uh, gin cocktails become more popular because it was really dark spirits that ruled the roost uh, in the early and, and mid 1800s. The Martinez invented sometime around the uh, 1880s and uh, and then something happened, perhaps tastes changed, not sure, but uh, the, the vermouth switched from sweet to dry, or French style vermouth. We typically refer to sweet vermouth as Italian vermouth and uh, dry vermouth as French, although both countries make both types these days. Uh, and um, you have the martini. Um, there are various early references to drinks that are very similar to it um, in, uh, in, during the 1890s. Um, but it wasn't until the early 1900s that we really had this drink and we could say, this is a martini, you are drinking it. Um, and then people started messing with the vermouth a little bit. It's, it went uh, originally quite a lot of vermouth, then it started going down and trends have kind of changed and we put more back in there again now. And, uh, you know, Winston Churchill famously said that the only uh, amount of vermouth you need in a martini is just a quick phone call to France. That's it. Um, obviously referring to the fact that that's where the vermouth comes from. And um, I've heard various other ones like just shine the light through the bottle onto the glass, that's enough. And, uh, you know, uh, it's it, crazy small amounts of vermouth. That's not to my preference personally because um, I think it becomes quite a simple drink when it is more or less just gin. Um, you know, if I wanted to drink just gin, I would order just gin, uh, which I have been known to do. Uh, but, you know, if I want a martini, I want an, an affinity between these ingredients, an interplay between them. and a struggle almost as they attempt to vie for my attention as I put the drink in my mouth. 
Um, and for me, that requires a little bit more than the, the few drops or a kind of wetting of the ice of vermouth. A little bit more. Um, and as bartenders, we, we generally refer to uh, martinis uh, in, in the form of ratios. Um, so what ratio of gin are you uh, mixing with vermouth? And um, the, d the driest uh, type of martini would involve the least amount of vermouth, because although it's called dry vermouth, it's actually sweeter than gin, which is a little one, difficult one to get your head around sometimes. But a uh, tiny amount of vermouth, very, very dry, might be a ratio of, say, 15 to 1. So 15 parts gin, and I don't mean this is 15 times the size of a 2 to 1, I just mean ratio. 15 parts gin to one part of vermouth. And, um, you might just get a sense of the vermouth there, but it's going to be very, very soft. A little bit too dry for my taste. Uh, a perhaps a more average martini, or average in terms of quality, but your average martini, the way it might, uh, might be made for you in a bar if you didn't really specify what you wanted, would be somewhere around six or seven to one. Um, and in that area, I think you're, you're starting to get um, a nice balance of flavour between the vermouth. You're getting some of the winey characteristics coming through. Also, you're getting a little bit of colour as well. And, and I think colour in a martini is, uh, is important. I don't want it to be ice clear. I want it to have depth and colour. And there's a poem by Ob Ogden Nash um, called A Drink With Something In It. Um, now it goes, there's something about a, a martini, a tingle remarkably pleasant, a yellow, a mellow martini. I wish that I had one at present. There's something about a martini at the dining and dancing begins. And to tell you the truth, it's not the move. I think it's perhaps the gin. And uh, it's, it's a really nice poem, but he refers to it as being a yellow martini. And I really like that idea that the drink is this sort of yellow hue to it. Because a lot of our tasting is done with our eyes. And um, just that slight offset of color there, that imperfection almost, like a yellow diamond, um, for me is quite exciting when I'm drinking a martini. So it's not just about taste, it is about color as well. Um, and if you were going for a wet martini, um, Obviously, all martinis are wet. Uh, the, uh, you would put more vermouth in there. So uh, you might go down to a two to one martini, where it would be two parts gin, one part vermouth. Or, as they are now serving in the States in some cocktail bars, moving over here a little bit, a fitty fitty. So 50 50, one of each. Uh, for me, that's becoming a bit of a flabby drink. Um, you've got a little bit too much winey characteristic coming in. It's kind of like vermouth fortified with gin, really. Um, you can try a one to two ratio as well, where you've, uh, you really are just fortifying for of gin. Not to everyone's taste, not really to mine. Um, I actually quite like that kind of drink served on the rocks, weirdly, and I'll touch upon that with martinis as well, because we don't generally serve them on the rocks, and for me, I think we should. We should start thinking about it, at least. Uh, so yeah, that's the kind of uh, the ballpark recipes, if you like, uh, for the drink. And then, um, obviously, you have garnishing as well. Um, we have uh, olives and uh, lemons here today, which are obviously the two most common garnishes. Interestingly, though, yeah, everyone kind of has a preference over an olive or a lemon. Most people tend to go with lemons these days, but it does make a big difference uh, to the drink, what you, what you garnish it with. Um, and especially, it can make too much of a difference if it's garnished incorrectly or badly. Um, and it is one of these things that we just kind of forget about. Olive or lemon? Okay, cool, mate. Thank you, no, done. Um, I mean, these olives are, are preserved in brine and therefore salty. And if too much brine ends up in the glass, your drink will become slightly salty, which might not be a bad thing for everyone. You might like a little bit of saltiness. And obviously, there does exist uh, such a drink as a dirty martini, which is made with either blended up olives or, uh, or the brine uh, splashed into the mixing beaker before stirring it down. Bit of a weird one. Well, I've seen people just put them away so quickly at bars, like, and it is nice as an aperitif, but you're consuming significant volumes of salt uh, in all of that. Um, so it's no wonder you want something to eat and probably something to drink that isn't a martini afterwards as well. A glass of water. Um, and, and likewise with lemon, and um, I think we probably underestimate how much a lemon peel can affect a martini. Um, I. Uh, Quite, um, I, I'm quite vocal about how I believe most bartenders don't know how to correctly garnish a martini with a lemon twist. Uh, because the usual uh, kind of approach is to take off a nice big piece of lemon peel and then to ream the hell out of it over the top of this perfect, otherwise perfect drink. And um, to the point where there's a film of lemon oil floating on top. 
and when it's served, lo and behold, it smells of lemon and not a great deal else. Um, that's a ruined martini in my eyes. You've messed it up at the uh, final, final hurdle there. And I like to think of a lemon twist like a machine gun in a room full of people. No, I'm not going to put a machine gun out, don't worry. But that is kind of what it's like. I mean, you, ha you are armed with lemon oil and you're dangerous. And uh, I, I take the approach that garnish from the greatest possible distance you can. Uh, smell the martini. Obviously, if you're making it for someone else, you can't really do that, but it's a good way of practicing. Smell the martini. If it smells of lemon, which it more than likely does, uh, <coughs> stop right there. And I'm also a fan of not putting the lemon twist in the glass. It's not to say you have to do what I say, because you don't, but invariably when you do that, unless you drink them really quickly, which I do, uh, you'll find that by the time you get to the bottom, it tastes of lemon. It tastes of lemon oil. And I mean, there's two main flavour compounds in lemon oil, uh, limonene and citral. They're the two kind of aromatic uh, oils that uh, are put in virtually every cleaning product that we have uh, in the world. Um, or pine, of course, which is kind of junipery. Um, so I was just thinking about that, actually. The two main cleaning products are pine-scented and lemon-scented. It's kind of like a martini, isn't it? Juniper is quite piney. Anyway, um, yeah, limonene and citral. Limonene uh, is is highly prone to oxidisation. Um, it's why if you juice a load of uh, lemons and uh, cause some of the oil will always get in there, it starts to smell a bit funky after about four or five hours. Um, and it's also why if you leave a martini sat around a little bit too long, you get back to it, and you're like, this lemon's just not fresh anymore. It's it's kind of a little bit jaded <coughs> and like. It, it's not contributing that zing that you want, it's just contributing a kind of generic lemon flavour. Um, and uh, that, that is because the limonene oxidises really quickly, so it's another one to be careful of, and that's why uh, I chuck the zest. Um, and the other thing is size, I'll cut some up in a minute. Um, unfortunately, I didn't bring a knife, um, so I have to do it with my fingernail. No, I'm just joking. Um, I've got this, which is not ideal, but um, we'll make it work somehow. Unless, unless I break it first. Um, I should probably make some drinks, really, because um, I can see you're all eyeing up the gin and the, uh, the vermouth there, and I'm just kind of teasing you, really, talking about martinis, and you probably want to drink them. Um, I'm just going to have a couple of drinks, talk to you a little bit about technique um, and about ice. I haven't looked at the ice yet. Uh -oh. oh, okay, right, we'll see. Um, we'll, talk, we'll discuss that in a minute. Uh, and then uh, I'll serve them up, um, and the first six of you that you can make it up here the quickest will get one. That's pretty much the way it works. Um, if I were you guys at the back, I'll get going now and climb over everyone straight down. Don't bother with the uh, sideway. Um, and uh, we've got, I'm going to make them with three diff. Uh, well, I probably will let, you're gonna use one of the Tanquerays. Let's use uh, Tanqueray 10 because then we've got quite a range of different. Um, oh, that's that way around. Okay, cool. Uh, different uh, styles of gin there um, to try. So, there are two ways of uh, making a martini. Well, there's more than two ways, actually. There's a lot of different ways. But there are two main, uh, main ways of doing it. One is shaking the drink. One is stirring the drink. Um, what's, you tell me, what's the difference? What's going to be the difference in the final drink if I shake it compared to if I stir it? What do you think? Dilution. Air. Dilution. Dilution. Temperature, okay. Uh, in theory, yes to all of those. Uh, but, well, no, actually, in theory, no to all of those, but in practice, generally, yes. Uh, the, the one that is, is certainly true is aeration. Of course, you're going to introduce aeration and air into the drink, and that's visible, and it's also uh, detectable on the tongue. Um, a shaken drink feels a lot different to a stirred drink. Um, the other two, dilution and temperature, as I said, uh, in practice, generally, yes, they will be different between a shaken and a stirred, but theoretically and physically, they are not different. Um, it's only because we don't stir our drinks for long enough that we don't get similar levels of temperature and dilution as we do when we shake them. Because ice is all about physics. It's simple, really. Um, when ice melts, uh, it draws a lot of energy from a liquid um, in order to do that, and as it draws energy from the liquid, the liquid cools down. Um, contrary to what most people think, ice does not chill drinks because it's cold. It chills them because it melts. And that's kind of a difficult one to get your head around. Uh, the fact that ice is cold, it, it has some contribution. Around about 5 to 10% of the chilling power of ice comes from the fact that it's cold, and that depends on the temperature of the ice itself, whether it's straight from a freezer or whether it's uh, sat here melting. Now, this ice here, the, the ice on the outside of uh, this ice cube, or ice sausage, 
uh, is, is melting in my hand right now. The temperature of that ice there is zero degrees Celsius because it's phase changing from solid into liquid. I know that because that's the temperature that <coughs> ice melts into water. Yet, I can chill this martini down to maybe minus five, minus six degrees Celsius. That tells me that the ice is chilling it from melting, not from the fact that it's cold. Otherwise, it would just get down to zero and that would stop because it physically can't take it down any further, being that it's only zero itself. Um, and this, uh, this melts is, is why uh, bartenders get really caught up about minimizing dilution. Don't over dilute it, it's the worst thing you can possibly do. But actually there is no chilling without dilution. You have to dilute the drink in order to chill it because you have to melt the ice. If ever you've got given uh, those whiskey stones for Christmas or whatever, they tend to arrive at Christmas, I don't know why. Uh, and, uh, and tried them by putting them in the freezer. I assume you know what I'm talking about, little granite rocks that are basically like ice cubes but they're made out of stone. Um, and put them in your glass of whiskey thinking, aha, that's not going to dilute my whiskey but it will make it cold. You probably found that actually it didn't really make it that cold at all. And that's because granite doesn't melt when you put it in a whiskey. Uh, it just sits there being slightly cold. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it, they're rubbish. Um, I mean, they are literally rubbish. <laughs> <laughs> Left over from some garden centre, probably. Uh, so um, we, we need our ice is good to us. We need it. It, it, it helps us chill the drink by melting, um, and uh, oh, we love it. There are a few things you can do, of course, to minimise uh, the dilution um, in respect of the condition of your ice. Um, for starters, using ice that's um, below zero degrees Celsius, i.e. stored in a freezer, um, is good because it's dry on the outside then. When I put this ice cube and its friends into a mixing beaker in a minute, all of that surface water that's on this ice is going to immediately distribute around the drink. Now collectively, I don't know how much it will be, maybe 10 mils of surface water across all of the ice, but as soon as it distributes around the drink, I've suddenly got a greater volume of liquid that I need to chill. Because I've got a greater volume of liquid I need to chill, I need to melt more ice to chill it. And so already, by using wet ice, I've contributed an initial, say, 10 mil of, of, of uh, water to the drink, and then probably another 10 mil at least uh, that's wasted just in the fact that I'm chilling extra volumes of liquid. So dry ice is always a good idea. Not dry ice as in carbon dioxide, but dry ice. Uh, although if you do want to minimise dilution, dry ice does work quite well, but it will carbonate your drink, of course. Liquid nitrogen also works quite well. Um, and I am speaking from experience because we do have liquid nitrogen at uh, my cocktail bar. Um, and that will minimise dilution, uh, well there will be no dilution. But of course with a martini, dilution I think is good. Um, some people will argue differently. If you go to the Duke's Hotel and uh, get a martini from uh, Alessandro Palazzi, um, he will simply pour uh, the gin directly from the freezer into the glass and uh, 100 mil of it, um, I might add, and uh, there is your drink. So no dilution um, at all and, and a pretty strong drink with it. It's a great experience, but it's not how I want to drink my martinis all the time. Um, so we like a little bit of dilution in there. Um, as I said before, fundamentally, shaking and stirring shouldn't affect temperature and dilution. Shaking just does what you want it to do a lot quicker. Um, and that's because it's a more aggressive action. You're moving liquid over ice a hell of a lot faster than you are if you're stirring. Not only that, when you shake, of course, the ice breaks down into smaller pieces. Now, smaller ice won't give you more, uh, give more dilution um, than, than larger ice. It will just do it a lot quicker. Again, it's simple physics. There's a weight of ice and a weight of liquid. And the two combine, whether you're shaking, stirring, whatever. The same physical actions will take place, the same amount of meltage, the same amount of temperature. It just happens over different periods of time. And ballpark figure, a 10 second shake is roughly equivalent to a two minute stir. And this is another one of my pet hates. Bartenders don't stir their martinis long enough. They get worried about dilution. Oh, I don't know what to do. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, give it a good two minute stir. You'll find you get a nice amount of dilution in there and you get the temperature right down. The drink is still chilling after 90 seconds. It's still going down. The other thing is you can't really over shake or over stir a martini. It's another myth. Uh, everyone kind of thinks that, well, if you make the drink and leave it in there of the ice, the ice is just going to keep on melting, the whole world's going to implode, and the martini's going to taste horrible. Um, but, again, with physics and with ice, um, it, it, it plateaus. This, this drop in temperature plateaus, as does the dilution. Once you get that drink down to minus six, minus seven degrees Celsius, 
the temperature just stays stable. It stays at minus 6, minus 7. It can't get much colder because the ice just isn't emitting enough chilling power to get it any colder. And also the ABV of the liquids inside uh, the, the mixing beaker or the shaker have dropped so sufficiently that they're not capable of, of being any colder without freezing. So um, as it plateaus off, the temperature won't get any lower. Of course, our dilution plateaus as well. We're not dropping the temperature. All we're doing is sustaining it. And to sustain that low temperature, minus 6, minus 7 degrees Celsius, just a tiny amount of melting is needed because all the ice is doing is combating the environmental temperature that's affecting the mixing beaker. This warmth that is constantly trying to heat this up, and the ice just holds it there. So um, I've done studies on this and, and um, weighed martinis after one minute, two minute, three minute, four minute, five minute stirs. I stopped there because I was getting boring and I was really thirsty. Uh, and uh, I found that, yeah, there's, there's very little uh, increase in dilution in the drink, very little, I mean, and negligible, really, um, after that initial couple of minutes of, of temperature drop. And likewise with shaking, I mean, you'd be a fool to shake a drink for 30 seconds anyway, because it's just a bit pointless. But it's not going to get any colder, it's just going to be aerating it, that's all. I will make a drink now. Uh, by the way, if you've got any questions, you don't have to wait till the end, I'm happy to do that now, uh, or whatever. So, um, we'll get some ice in our, in our tin here. Um, you can't really over-ice it, that's not possible, uh, but you can under-ice it. Um, if you, and this applies to gin and tonics and many other cocktails and drinks with ice in them, too little ice in there and you'll actually get more dilution uh, because the drink will never get to the, the low temperature it wants to achieve and plateau off. It'll be constantly trying to get there um, and there's just not enough chilling power from the ice to, to, to chill the liquid and combat the, the, the heat of the, the shaker and of the room that you're making it in. Um, so yeah, it's better to look, uh, uh, over ice it. Um, and chances are it'll chill out ever so slightly quicker as well. Um, the ice size doesn't matter a great deal. The water that's on the ice is far more relevant and more important. Um, smaller ice will do the job quicker for you, um, but invariably smaller ice has lots of surface water on it. Um, we have crushed ice at our bar, and um, I'm a big fan of stirring drinks down or shaking drinks with crushed ice because it does the job really, really quickly. It won't, it won't be any more temperature drop, it won't be any more dilution, um, because it is simple physics, as long as the ice is dry. And so we refreeze it um, and, and use it that way sometimes. Uh, the other way you can do it is get the ice, uh, the, the, the crushed ice, put it in a salad spinner, spin it round and it flicks all the, all the water that's sort of held in its nooks and crannies off, which is a, a surprising amount. And, uh, and then you can use that in a cocktail and uh, it'd be absolutely fine. Um, but we do get kind of worked up about ice, all the quality of the ice, and all I care about really is whether it's wet or not because the wet means initial dilution. Um, so yeah, I've got a good uh, tin full of uh, ice there. You can use glass, you can use metal. You will have slightly less dilution in glass, interestingly, than you will over metal, and that's because glass is less thermally conductive. It's more of an insulator. And so this is freezing cold already. How do you think that happened? My ice is melting. Right? If it was glass, it would not be freezing cold already. And that's because it's, it's a better insulator and it doesn't draw that much uh, chilling energy, if you like, uh, from, from the ice itself. Uh, let's go with uh, Jensen's, actually let's go with Sipsmith first. I haven't actually tried this one yet, VJAP. See what it's like. Um, I will measure with this. Where are we on a 2CL? Okay. So uh, let's make a, uh, a 6 to 1 martini here. Um, or, or two of them, in fact. And uh, let's see how that comes out. So, uh, let's do another one. So that's 120, 120 mil, I think. Um, six to one, so I'm going to put just 20 mil of donut in there. Other vermouth brands are available. But this is one of my favourites. And then we stir. So, if you're consciously making a stirred martini, and I have been known to unconsciously make them, uh, 
you don't want it to have the effect of a shaken martini, um, i.e. lots of dissolved air bubbles and that texture on the palate. So the aim will be to stir it as gently as possible, and that really can be, you can, you can monitor that audibly. Um, if it's making lots and lots of noise, the chances are it's being swished around and, and stirred up and uh, getting all confused. So, uh, and that is, e that is easier with uh, larger cubes of ice, it has to be said, um, once you start getting in the realms of this kind of chaff, if you like, uh, it, it does become a little bit more difficult. Um, so, probably about a minute of stirring, keep on going a bit longer. Everyone had a good day? <laughs> Do you have a question about glassware from martini? Yeah. Your thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, well, that kind of links in with what I was going to say about serving martinis on the rocks. Um, because, as you can probably tell by now, I'm a bit of a fan of ice. Uh, and it's what it does, it's magical properties. Um, uh, I, I do think... Uh, delicious. Um, I, I, do, I do think that we should definitely consider the uh, idea of actually serving martinis on the rocks. Now, I, I don't get too caught up about glassware in, in martinis. Um, this kind of glass here is not particularly on trend at the moment. Most of the cocktail bars will be using the, uh, the coupe style, which is the kind of rounded, almost champagne dish type glass. They're a little bit cooler. Um, I think probably thanks to the 90s, where obviously we were getting apple pie martinis and Dorito and cheese martinis and any other kind of martini you can think of. And uh, they've, we were like, mm, I'd rather not use that. The memory is still a little bit uh, there. So um, this peel is not ideal, by the way. Um, it's not my, not my normal practice. Um, but uh, one important thing about glassware is it's cold. These aren't cold, obviously. Um, but. Again, you know, this drink's going to start warming up as soon as it hits a glass like this. And the bigger the glass, the more it's going to warm the cocktail up. And um, we don't want it to be warm, we want it to be cold. Um, I'm actually doing a seminar at Tales of the Cocktail this year uh, on drink temperature. Um, because the assumption is that all cocktails should be as cold as we can possibly make them. And I think that assumption may be wrong. Uh, you know, really, should all cocktails be as cold as we can get them? Or would some cocktails benefit from being a little bit warmer? But no such kind of beverage temperature chart exists. Um, we just don't have it. And, you know, chefs are very concerned about the temperature in which they serve their food, but we just don't really think about it with cocktails. Um, and there may be an argument that drier martinis should be served colder than wetter martinis, for example. Or it may be the other way around, I don't really know. Yeah, I mean, that smells of lemon, and it's, look at the size of that thing, it's pathetic. Um, right, who wants to drink one? <coughs> they're, they're up quick over there. Uh, does someone want to come and take them away from me before I drink them? <laughs> Never hold it by the top, come on, there you go. <laughs> um, so, six to one with... Uh, <laughs> Meanwhile, I will. Um, I'll make a couple more and put them in sample cups so you've all got a taste. Don't worry, it's plenty of gin outside, Peter. Uh, it's all good. Are they getting angry up there? No, if, if we'll get a sip, we'll pass them on. It's well travelled. <laughs> Yeah, you notice I just free poured that one, eh? Thought you weren't looking. <laughs> but this is the kind of cool thing. It doesn't matter that much. I mean, you know, the ratio is going to be roughly there. If, if I was making it for you and you knew specifically what you wanted, great. But I'm making it for a whole range of you, so hit it somewhere in the middle there and it should be okay. That is, that is, that is good. Nice? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Bartenders. No, you, 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 not many, not many uh, guests communicate it in that way. Um, they may communicate it dry or wet or somewhere in the middle there, um, but they wouldn't generally use the sort of uh, it, do it in numeric terms like that. But it's a good way for us to communicate it back at them. So oh, when you say wet, what do you mean? Three to one, three parts of gin, one part remove, and they go, oh yeah, yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, they they, they get it. Um, but not many people, apart from regulars, would would come in and uh, and order it that way, straight off. But I order it that way wherever I go, if I'm having a martini, because it, it leaves uh, nothing to chance. And for a simple drink, there's a hell of a lot of ways of messing it up. Um, and that's actually because it's not that simple at all. Um, it just The only thing simple about it is there's only two bottles involved. Um, besides that, everything is quite difficult with a martini, because you're naked, you're on show, you're there flashing with your trousers down. If you, if you do anything too wrong, it's going to be very, very apparent. Whereas if you're making a tiki drink with a dozen ingredients in it, you know, it's going to end up with a kind of mushy, generic, fruity, rummy, limey flavour to it. Um, all right. Let's get these out. Now, plastic is actually a pretty good vessel for a martini to be served in because I was talking about thermal conductivity earlier, and uh, I've got loads. Uh, and uh, plastic is an insulator. I mean, it's very low thermal conductivity, so you'll never, you know, when you get a bottle of coke out of a fridge in a news agent, you're never sure if it's been in there very long or not because the plastic just doesn't really get cold, and that's because it's a, it's an insulator. And uh, the same goes for martinis. Now, I'm not suggesting that we all start drinking martinis out of plastic cups, but because um, it, it would kind of lose the uh, luxury element. But it has to be said, it's, uh, it's a good material for that kind of thing. Um, I've actually got a patent pending on uh, a polystyrene cocktail shaker. I haven't really, but I should do. <laughs> because polystyrene, of course, is a brilliant insulator. Um, and uh, if we were to shake or stir a drink in styrofoam, we would have absolutely no dilution uh, contributing to the, the chilling of the vessel. Dilution would only be chilling the liquid. And so you'd get a highly undiluted drink. Uh, and uh, you'd look like a bit of an idiot in the process because you'd be stirring a drink in a styrofoam cup. Um, and it's also why, at the other end of the scale, I'm, I'm not a big fan of uh, copper, silver, gold, aluminium shakers because they are highly conductive. It's why we use them in wiring and all that kind of stuff, they conduct to It's why chefs use copper pans, because you turn the gas down, it's so conductive it will cool very quickly, or it'll heat up very quickly. But for cocktail bartending, that's exactly what you don't want, because as soon as you put your liquid in your ice into a copper shaker, vroom, it gets freezing cold within a matter of seconds, and that's all thanks to ice melting. Though, having said that, you know, a bit of dilution is good, and it may be your preference to have that dilution in a martini. So, I'm a bit of an advocate of bartenders having different material shakers on their stations so that they can select the correct one based on the requirements of the guest. Right, there's a few more there. Not enough for everyone, but I'm going to make some more anyway. So. Tristan, can I get you to close about five minutes so they can get some gin outside before we close? That's absolutely fine. Has anyone got any questions? What strength do you recommend to use in the gin? The strength in the final glass. The strength of gin. I mean, the strength of gin. Well, I mean, I don't recommend any strength because it really depends on what you want the drink to taste like at the end, and that's different for everyone, of course. Um, some people would prefer. That's good. Some people would prefer. A much stronger drink, some people prefer a light drink. And you know, when we talk about ABV and gins, of course, it's, it has a huge effect on how the flavour of the gin comes across. You know, a, you know, a few degrees uh, difference can accentuate completely different botanicals in, uh, in, in a gin. And it is the same thing with uh, martini, but of course that depends on what gin you use in the first place, what vermouth you use in the first place, and what botanicals you want to taste in the martini. So 
I mean, it's a, it's a, in answer to your question, it's a consideration that we should make, but it's not something I can answer because it's different in every, every single scenario. Uh, any other questions? I'll quickly smash out a tanker at 10 more. How does it shake it aerating it? Yeah. Well, I mean, mouthfeel and flavour are connected. Um, you know, flavour as a whole is influenced by many factors. You know, you're talking about what you can see, what you can hear. We did a trick once where we were giving people um, playing the sound of crunching popcorn whilst giving them stale popcorn. Um, with the sort of multi sensory room in the bars in, in, in East London, and we were doing all this kind of stuff. So, uh, sound is important. Uh, certainly texture and temperature in your mouth are important. Um, then there's the taste of the drink itself, as in what influence it's having on the tongue. And uh, you've got the smell as well. Um, by the way, that's a good point. Chill, chill these down before you use them. Put out the freezer or the fridge. And of course, you're not going to get any dilution then from your, uh, uh, from your eyes. Um, but... Uh, so, so it, will, it will have an effect on, on flavour, but it's almost impossible for us to define how it affects that flavour because there's so many other influences that are taking place on it. Um, but on, on face value of it, yes, it affects the way it, it moves around on your tongue. And, and well, for me, a, a stirred martini feels a lot more, I'll do a shaken one actually, feels a lot more fluid, like a stream, it kind of washes around the place. Um, you'd think that the shaker would be more vibrant, but for me, the, the stirred is actually more vibrant because it seems to sort of swirl around the place a lot more easily, whereas the shaker holds on your tongue. It sits there and it doesn't fizz, but it feels, um, it feels like it's full of energy, but it's not expending that energy. Uh, that's kind of my rough romantic take on the shaking stir. While, while Tristan's <coughs> just completing making some more martinis, I really would like to wrap up today. I have three very simple thank yous. Firstly, thank you to all the speakers today for taking time to prepare what they said and presenting today. Thank you very much to, to all of you today. Secondly, thank Nicholas Cook for organising today in cooperation with Paul Hughes from Heriot Watt. And thirdly, thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed the day. I think it's been a fascinating day. We've learned covers so many aspects of gin, distillation, distribution, and whatever day, and including how to make it perhaps a perfect martini. So thank you very much for all coming, and enjoy your martini or gin and tonic. Thank you.